So even if you consider yourself not a designer, you'll still be placed in situations where you have to do some design. Fortunately, Tracy Osborne is a designer and a developer, as well as author of Hello Web Books. She's going to take us through the basics of visual and user experience design. Please make Tracy feel welcome. Whoop. Hello. So as mentioned, I am Tracy. Uh, I am Lime Daring on the internet, so you can find me on Twitter, on Macedon, on uh, Speaker Deck, which is where I'm going to publish these slides afterwards. And um, so yeah, don't need to take notes. I'm going to throw a lot of resources at you during this presentation uh, so you can find these slides and those places afterwards. You might know me from my books. Uh, Hello Web App is my, my book teaching web development using Django, and I have some with me uh, to anyone who's bought my books. Um, it's really expensive to ship from Canada to here, so I, I just brought a whole bunch um, to save, save everyone on shipping, so in case you're interested. But more relevant for this presentation is my uh, Hello Web Design books, which uh, um, I originally did this presentation, I gave it a bunch of conferences, uh, wrote the book after doing this presentation, and now I'm doing the presentation again with updated resources and whatnot. So it's been pretty fun. And FYI, I came here from Canada after 20 hours of flying at 7 a.m. this morning, so if I act a little more loopy than normal, it's a little bit of loopiness is normal for me, but um, I'm gonna be on the extreme end for this presentation, have patience. Okay, so what do I mean by design? Design's kind of a huge, gigantic field. This is like me going to a design conference and doing a half an hour presentation and saying, programming for non-programmers, <laughs> half an hour. So I'm, what I mean by design, I just mean, in general, making a design that works well. Very broad. I'm not gonna go really into a lot of nitpicky things, but hopefully at the end of this 30 minute session, you'll pick up just enough to get you comfortable with starting to work on design and starting to do design. And why should you know a bit about design? Because even if you're a programmer, you probably are already doing open source projects, and for those open source projects, you're gonna need a home page. You know, maybe you're doing a presentation at a conference and you need to work on your slides create your personal website, this is my own, this is my husband's, who's also a programmer. Uh, Eurolib3, hey, if you, know, if you know that package in Python, he did that. Anyways, loopiness, ah, I'm awake. Let's get started. Let's talk about clutter. Now, if there's only one thing I want you to take, back, take away from this presentation in terms of becoming a better visual designer, I want you to think about clutter. And what you can do um, whenever you're working on design is just reducing cluttering your designs is gonna make you a better, uh, better designer and help you do better designs. And by clutter, I love to show this. <laughs> Everyone remember this? It's like different fonts and different colors and images and alignments and there's boxes and the boxes are all different colors and it's, it's insane. The fastest way for better looking designs is to cut down on clutter. So in this presentation, I'm gonna take this little form and I'm gonna go through some of the big design principles and we're gonna apply them to this form and how these design principles all relate to clutter uh, and we're going to improve the way this looks. So we're gonna start out with grid. In general, again, this is a very broad strokes. In general, grid um, is just lining things up trying to, to put things on a, an invisible skeleton. Uh, because th when things are not like a little bit off set from other things, it's gonna lend this like unconscious feeling of uh, chaoticness when things aren't lining up. And the shortcut here is, you know, embrace uh, grid systems in CSS frameworks if you're working on the web, or in embrace using guidelines if you're working on something that doesn't have a web component. And thankfully most, uh, online CSS frameworks include a grid or um, some kind of alignment already within them. So Bootstrap, Foundation, Skeleton, all have an integrated grid system. It's gonna make it super simple to just start lining things up and making sure that your columns at the top of your page and the middle of your page all are on this invisible skeleton. And of course, CSS grid is becoming uh, more and more of a thing. So taking this little form, 
You might notice that there's things that are a little bit offset from other things. And we're just going to line them up. We're just going to even out those, um, the vertical axes that the, you know, the form is all the same width, the text is all the same width. It all starts on the same left um, line, invisible line. Next uh, principle we're going to cover is color. Again, as all these things are. Again, very, very broad strokes. I'm going to give you a couple of shortcuts just to get you started because we're not going to go into color theory because no one wants to do that. So in general, some really good rules of thumb. Uh, in general, it's a good idea to keep your colors complementary. And what do I mean by that? It means when you have a color wheel, the color that's across the way from another color tends to look really good with that color. So uh, you know, um, blues look good with orange, which is why you see this everywhere. And in uh, um, TV tropes, the orange-blue contrast. You know, these colors tend to look good together. So when you're working on colors for a project, that's kind of a nice thing to just start out with when you're um, just starting out. And I like to use, uh, in general, neutrals with one brighter color to highlight important bits. When we get into this a little bit later in this presentation. But these are good things to start out with. Of course, when you are a better designer, you can break these rules. You can do like super colorful uh, designs. You can do monochromatic designs. But for new designers, I think these are really good rules of thumb. And there's this great article on uh, Smashing Magazine. It's a simple web developer's guide to color. So it's like color theory for developers. And I recommend this if you want to go into a little bit more about color theory. But Let's not start from scratch, because creating a color palette from scratch, when you're working on a design, you have to be like, OK, what colors am I going to use? And just you know, working from a blank palette. No one does that. I don't do that. I use color palette websites, and I have a background in design. So thankfully, there's a lot of websites out there that help you create a color scheme. Uh, this is color.adobe.com. There's material design. Material.io has a whole color tool. Uh, my current favorite is this one called colormind.io. And this is the kind of thing where you can, you can generate a full palette, uh, or you can like, lock a couple of colors in, or put in your own color, and then generate just three. And it's going to create um, colors that look, look good with other colors. So this is where I start. This is where my books, the color schemes for my books, I always start from this, um, using things like this, uh, color schemes for any of the designs I do. So going back to this form, uh, we're going to add some colors. And we're just going to need to, you know, uh, colors look weird up here. It's actually like green. Actually, I wonder if I have flux on because I'm from the US. Hey, I'm going to do this really quickly because I think my flux is making things weird. Hey, that looks a little bit weirder. All right, I did my best. <laughs> OK, so yay, projectors. Anyways, there's colors on here. There's orange. There's a green background. Can't really see it. Um, but you can see it when I put the slides up online later. I can't hear you. So you're mumbling. This is <laughs> We're just going to move on. All right, topography. Again, another huge area. Choosing fonts kind of suck. Uh, we're going to go with these rule of thumbs. Keep the number of fonts low uh, when you're starting out. And it's a good idea to just like, stick with just two different fonts in a design. You know, don't do that, go, that GoDaddy craziness where you have different fonts, Helvetica, Arial, whatever, everywhere. And you can do a lot with just two different fonts. Uh, this is just my resume, actually. Um, two different fonts on here uh, using different treatments, italics, uppercase, spacing things out. But it's just two. And so it looks a little more cohesive while still um, looking very designy. It's another good rule of thumb to use fancy or display fonts sparingly. So uh, by that, I mean, you might remember this from the 90s, early 2000s, lots of uh, font websites like this. Now, you can use these things in a design. Of course you can. You can break all these rules. Uh, but in general, these kind of fonts look cluttery. So uh, if you're just starting out, it's a, you know, it's a good place to start on um, uh, by choosing a cleaner font from the get-go. And like I said, if my resume, if you want more differentiation in your text, you can use things like bolding and italics um, and transforms, uh, rather than, say, choosing yet another font to add to your design. 
So those are the principles, but let's talk about the shortcuts because that's, you know, really, we're busy. We want to be building our project, not futzing over design. So there's curated font websites out there that help you choose, um, make it easier to choose a font. Instead of going onto Google Fonts and scrolling through whatever hundreds of fonts they have now, uh, you can go to a website like Beautiful Web Type, uh, which just showcases um, some like really nice uh, Google Fonts and how they play well, like ones that play well with others. TypeWolf also has a curated collection of 30 best Google Fonts. There's font pair that just pairs two fonts together. Um, uh, what is this one? This is brick. It's brick.io. That's wrong on the bottom. But essentially, there's, there's places on the web that people have curated, like Google Fonts and also Typekit and all these other font um, resources. So when you're just starting out with design, you don't have to go through and try to pick something from scratch. You can just rely on these curated collections. So going back to here, we're going to update the fonts a little bit. And it's pretty similar, but instead of using, I think the, the one on the left is using Arial and Helvetica and then Georgia at the top. Um, now it's just PT, PT Sans and PT Serif, which are two fonts that are available um, on Google Fonts. And they're of the same family. And that's another like, little trick. So if, if something has the same name, PT Sans, PT Serif, that means that they're probably designed together and they work well together. Uh, next up is white space, and this is the ultimate clutter reducer. White space is a thing you can use to, to reduce the feeling of clutter almost instantly. And first, it can also make a, um, a website feel more professional, luxurious. And that's why you see, you know, yachting websites. Of course, it's just, you know, acres of white space and no text and this beautiful background image. If you go onto these uh, curated design websites, like the ones that are like top CSS designs, you know, take a random screenshot. Of course, all of them have just acres of white space. It's a very, very trendy thing to do to make your design feel more modern. Uh, we don't have to just use acres of white space when you're trying to use white space. Uh, this is the New York Times uh, homepage redesign. And the before, um, what they did between the before and after, not only did they, one of the things they did was they reduced the number of colors in the sign. They took away those blue, uh, those, um, the blue links made them black. But they added just a little bit more space in the columns. And by adding space in the columns and kind of lining up on the, um, the vertical, uh, they had like little borders in between the columns, just a little bit of space made a big difference in that design. They reduced the clutter just enough. But it's not just a trend. White space can also make your website, your design easier to use because it's gonna be easier for people to see and um, do what you want them to do. So in this example, what they did between the left and the right is that they took this, uh, this form, excuse me, this table, they added more vertical space in between the table uh, contents, and they kind of took out those links, just adding a little bit more white space in between the tables. And this led to a 20% improvement in engagement, 5% boost in products out of the cart, and a 33% improvement in customers continuing on their purchase. So back to our little form, which you can't see the background, but we're just going to add some more white space to it. So we're gonna add space um, you know, between the, the lines of text. We're going to add spacing in the form elements by adding a little bit more space um, in the inputs, uh, add some more space in the button, just kind of air it out just a little bit. In general, when it comes to visual design, uh, reducing visual clutter is one of the big steps you can, you can take to making uh, your designs look better. And you can do that by keeping the number of fonts and colors low, adding white space, and lining things up. So in general, as a new designer, I recommend people to stick with a clean design. You can always play things more as you get better, um, but that's a really great way to place a start. But we're not done yet, because we need to talk about a user experience, because design isn't just how it looks, but also how it works. And this is another area that I could probably do an hours long presentation on, and I'm gonna stuff it into just a few minutes. In general, uh, whenever you're working on design, don't just try to make it look good, but try to think about what you want someone to do. So if you're working on a form, you want someone to be able to fill out that form. If you're working on, uh, 
like a blog post and you have a call to action in your blog post, instead of hiding that call to action as like a link within a paragraph, try pulling out that link and making an actual form and having a button there that draws the eye. Because uh, when you're working on design, if you say, yeah, I'm writing this blog post because hopefully someone will then sign up for my newsletter. Keeping that in mind will help you um, focus on the things that you need people to see and use. And this is why buttons on forms are generally a brighter color than the, the, um, the, the rest of the form. So it wants to draw the eye. It wants someone to know how to submit that form. And it's why, you know, when you have big banners on websites, uh, it's why this, this website has a fairly um, desaturated background and a nice bright blue button right in the, right in the front. Um, catch the eye. This doesn't have to be buttons. Uh, this is the Wealthfront engineering blog. And you can argue that Wealthfront has this blog because they want people to read the articles written by the engineers. And they go, wow, this place looks like a great place to work. And then, boom, there's this bright green uh, badge on the, um, the right side to draw the eye. And hopefully, people will click on it and apply to work at Wealthfront. So this is really um, condensed. But in general, try to pay attention to your goals. Make them easy to find and use. Think about that when you're working on design, not just how it looks, but how it's working. And this is a place where you need to start paying attention to data and analytics. Because after you design something and release it into the world, you should see whether it is working in the way that you want it to. All right, content. This is also part of design. It's not just like the colors and the typography, but it's the actual words you have on the page. So going over some of those big principles, less is more. Now, people who are working on design, say, creating their about page for their, um, their personal website tend to put in a giant essay about themselves. Well, people do not read on the internet. They do not read in whole. They skim. Uh, and the shorter, more concise you can make something, the more likely that the person on your website or your design is going to read it. So if you have something like this, please note that although Chrome is supported for both Mac, Mac and Windows operating systems, it is recommended that all users of the site switch to the most up-to-date version of the Firefox web browser for the best possible results. Whew. That is so long. It's technically correct. Like, that's an actual, that's a sentence. Uh, but you can read it, you can rewrite it as just simply for best results, use the latest version of Firefox, Chrome for Mac and Windows is also supported. Much more concise, easier to understand, much shorter, easier to read. So in general, big paragraphs are a sign of clutter. So if you have a lot of paragraphs on whatever you're designing, think about ways you can make it shorter um, and easier to skim. Like a good rule of thumb for this is like uh, two to three sentences per paragraph and break into bullets if you can. Um, so if you have a way, if you have a paragraph that's kind of annoying to read, and it's a listing of items, you see this a lot on blog posts on Medium, and people will throw these bullets in and give someone a place so that they can skim and, and um, uh, skim over the content and see better the interior of the paragraph. OK, moving on to headlines. That's also part of content. <laughs> Uh, headline hints, keep them succinct. Same thing with content. Try to keep them short and sweet. Uh, and use natural and friendly language. Don't sound like a robot. A lot of people do, will um, uh, tend to think really clinically when they're thinking about the words they put on their website. And talk benefits, not details. For example, this is technically what my book is about, my Pillow Web App book. It is an introduction to building web apps using Python and Django. But this is a terrible headline. A much better, more compelling headline is learn how to build a web app. This tells that this is the talking, the benefits to the readers, not the details of what my books are about. And this is another place where a headline change can like improve your bottom line. Uh, so essentially, this blog post is just all they did is they took their headline and changed it to talk benefits instead of um, just the details and improved conversions by 52.8%. So we're not done with this. We, we kind of opened it up and made it look less cluttery. But let's update the text as well. You know, make it a little welcome back. Log back into your account. It sounds more human. Um, you know, instead of this like, boring link at the bottom that says password or username recovery, you, know, you turn it into like, a human sounding question. Last but not least, images and imagery. Uh, 
the big rules of thumb here. Stock photos generally look like stock photos. Uh, you can do a lot without having any photos or any imagery on your website. So maybe, you know, especially if you're working on like an open source project, uh, you can get away with just doing flat colors and just um, and maybe like a screenshot of, of a terminal window. Remember to pay attention to file size also. It's another reason why I try to avoid using a lot of big images um, because it can blow it up your website. And because we have what Retina uh, computers now, you'll have to have giant images to make them look good on Retina screens. But nice icons and images can go, can really elevate a design. Yeah, and they can be pretty simple like this um, example on Stripe. So my favorite resource for finding nice looking, not stock images is unsplash.com. Uh, and this is all free for use. Anyone can use them. You can use them for your commercial projects. Uh, it's a really, really great place for nice professional quality looking, professional looking images. Uh, Photopin searches Flickr for Creative Commons images, and it's a good resource for finding pictures of people doing things. You know, in places like Fiverr, like some people don't, like some designers don't like Fiverr because you know you're you're getting cheap design. But I think for someone who is working on their first design project and you want to get some simple icons done, Fiverr is a great place for doing for finding that. Now these are this is a website done by some friends of mine, and a their homepage, they're above the fold contents is very simple, very flat, um, just shows a terminal window. But one of the things that they did was really cool is they, they went away from the typical uh, techie imagery and they worked with a local artist in Toronto to um, do these little illustrations for them. And you don't usually see that on a, a very techie looking website, kind of um, uh, made them stand out. So you can get away from just using tech, uh, like stock photos or, you know, stock item icons, you can work with a local designer uh, and get something that looks kind of cool for your project. So back to this, you know, what about adding a little icon on here? You know, in the, the full version, there's a little bit of background, like a subtle background as well. Um, but you just have to just add like a little cherry on top. The, the imagery, just adding this icon doesn't do much for the usability of the form but it makes it just look a little nicer. And that's kind of what I, the way I view icons and imagery and whatnot. It's just like that cherry on top. So for the res these resources, we've gone from doing this, going from here to here, which is pretty cool. Applying these design principles in a step-by-step -step manner. All right, last little bit on theory um, and the importance of imitation. So if you are a new designer and you have to work on a new project and you sit down at your desk and you wipe it clean and you're like, I'm going to work on this design, you pull out paper and pencil, starting from scratch with no inspiration. That's a lot like trying to work on a new programming project without the use of Google or Stack Overflow. Inspiration, looking at other uh, designs, uh, you know, I... I always have to be careful in this part because I don't want—I don't want to be like go steal that, inf you know, those designs out there. But be inspired. Look at what other people are doing. Uh, feel, get the ideas from that. So, uh, my Hello Web App book is very obviously um, inspired by the awesome-looking uh, book of art books. You know, uh, dramatic typography, flat colors, bright, pretty simple. Uh, I did not copy a book apart, but I used them to inspire my books. And my books wouldn't look the way they do um, if I didn't have a book apart for inspiration. So there's a lot of places online uh, to find inspiration, a lot of places where people curate design, uh, like Site Inspire, Unmatched Style, CSS Mania. There's a bunch of websites out there that just people just curate what they think looks like good design. And when you find something that you think looks good, uh, don't just be like, hey, that's awesome. Uh, try to think about it critically, because this is a, this is a uh, process that will help train your design intuition. So for the GitHub uh, website, you're like, hey, this is a good looking website. Why is it good looking? Why does it seem to be working well? Uh, has a nice big green button that's, you know, again, drawing the eye to this form. Uh, the form is really simple and easy to fill out. Uh, has a really nice, succinct, uh, um, headline, you know, the text has open source and business 
that's highlighted because so that kind of also draws the eye and this is the kind of thing you see first. So when you see a good design, don't just like say, hey, it's a good design. Try to think about what makes a good design or what makes a bad design. And this is gonna train your design intuition and when you're working on you know, future projects, it'll be easier for you to kind of regurgitate that design, um, make it easier to do your own designs from scratch. You know, and this is kind of a joke in the art world. Uh, Pablo Picasso said, probably not true, uh, good artists copy, great artists steal. Then Bansky took it and said that artists imitate, the great artists steal. There's full on books about this. Um, so don't hesitate to, to look at inspiration uh, and use that to help inform your designs. In the last little bit, I just want to do a little review of the design process to make it feel a little bit less intimidating, at least how I do it. So the very step one is to collect inspiration and sketch ideas. And I actually do this, I actually follow a bunch of those, those website design um, websites in my Feedly, like Google Reader clone. Um, and I can step through and pick out the ones I think have good ideas and kind of sketch them out. Now when I say sketching, I don't mean this. This person is showing off. Sketches do not have to look like this. Sketching is just boxes and lines and squiggles. Whatever, you, whatever works for you to kind of like get those ideas out on paper so you can refer to them later. So these are sketches from my redesign of the um, Hello Web Books website. Now when it comes to mocking something up, some, you might be tempted to go straight to HTML, but mocking up makes it easy to move around elements and try new things faster than if you're working in code or like working in HTML. It doesn't have to look perfect. Uh, so I was doing this mock-up for a project that my husband was working on, and this mock-up, just black and white, not the fonts we're gonna use, obviously not the colors we're gonna use, um, but it allowed us to figure out the layout and the content and then how we wanted things to be working on this very simple design. Uh, occasionally, I will do full-on like, mock-ups like this, but this is really rare. As a designer, when I'm working as a design uh, freelancer, it's more likely to look like this, which is figure out how things are gonna be working rather than the looking. And then build it, which is, you know, blah. So, I'm gonna leave you with this. This is my thought process. I've been doing design since, well, technically since I was 12, and I'm 33 now, so that's a long time. And every single time we're working on a new design, this is what goes on through my head. Every time. <laughs> and sometimes it's not even yes, maybe it's maybe. But it always starts out like awful, terrible, I'm a terrible designer, nothing is working right until the magical moment where I kind of move something into place and I'm like, oh, this actually looks like a real design. So if you're feeling that way, working as an, uh, on design, I, I assure you you're not a bad designer, you're just simply a designer. Welcome to the club. So this is only the starting point. Remember to, when you're working on designs, we're on the visual design, reduce that clutter, that visual clutter. You do that by keeping the number of fonts and colors low, adding white space, aligning things up, and keeping content short and easy to skim. Make sure your goal is easy to find and use. So think about what you want to achieve with your design, not just how it's gonna look. Keep your content simple, friendly, and to the point. And above all, practice, practice, practice. Because I assure you that it's gonna be easier, just like programming, um, gets easier over time, so does design. So I have um, this presentation in written format on Medium. Uh, so if you want to read it in full on text words, it is there. And there's also a whole book version. I have a few of these books on me. Um, so yeah, I hope this was informative. Thank you for having me.